Good morning. Good morning. Well, a couple of you got it. <laughs> Try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we're all on the same page now, I think. Have you ever stopped to think about how vain human wisdom is and human understanding, human knowledge? We think we got it all figured out sometimes, don't we? Julie read us some verses from the Psalms before we started rehearsal this morning, and she finished it up with, God's thoughts are very deep. The stupid person cannot understand. And I went, wow, that's me some days. I don't understand, Lord, but it doesn't change the fact that his thoughts are so much higher than ours. There's so much that we don't understand. It doesn't make sense to us. But his thoughts, his planning, his methods are perfect every single time. And we can place our hope in that stability, in that wisdom and that understanding, because he is God. He is the creator. He's the sustainer, the giver of life. He's offered us an opportunity to have spiritual life in him, to be adopted into his family. Isn't that awesome? Amen. We can be adopted as God's children, have all the rights of those who would have been born his children. Well, let's start, stand this morning as we start singing. We're going to do an old hymn that is one of my favorites because the bass part's awesome. <laughs> but my hope is in the Lord. God, we bow before you this morning in humble worship, Father. And Lord, this is corporate worship. This is not a performance. Lord, we acknowledge before you that we desire to worship you in spirit and in truth in ways that please you, Father God. And yet, many of us come with burdens on our hearts, physical ailments, Lord, things that have... Uh, 
grieved us at times during the week, Father God, perhaps even our own sin as we've dealt with it, Lord God. Lord, I do pray for that person this morning, Father, that is grappling with physical issues, Lord, spiritual issues, mental issues, Lord. I do pray that you would um, surround that person. Get, I pray, Lord, that you, we would corporately, Father, um, gain strength from you, Father. We, we need to draw from you freely. Help us to do that, Father. And Lord, we do pray this morning as we worship. We pray for our pastors this morning as they shepherd us and feed us, Lord. And we thank you for their faithfulness, Lord. We do pray for your hand of protection and provision and that, Lord God, that um, they would be empowered to excellence of ministry, Lord, as they seek to, to serve, Lord, as, as our shepherds. Lord, I pray for Pastor Ray this morning, Father, as he preaches the word. And, Lord, we need ears to hear um, what your servant would preach this morning. Lord God, we, we know that um, your word is, uh, is a joy, and it's a joy, Lord, to, to be in obedience to your commands, Lord, a joy. And we, so, Lord, help us to embrace the word as it's preached and to apply it well to our lives, Father God. We do pray as well as we sing and as we pray, Lord, and in all manner of worship today, we want to be pleasing to you, Father. And as well, would you bind us together as a body of Christ, Father God, as we worship and as we fellowship later on, Father God, be with us in our midst, we pray. Empower us for the week coming up, Lord God, and we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. What a joy to gather and worship as a family this morning. Uh, and we want to extend a special welcome to you this morning. If this is your first time at McCoy Memorial Baptist Church, we're thankful that you're worshiping with us. And if this is your first time, there are guest cards in the pew. Uh, we're thankful that you're here. If you could take one out and fill it out for us in a few moments, our ushers will take up an offering. You could place that in the offering plate for us. That'd be your gift to us this morning. We want to know your name and know you by name, and we're thankful that you're here. We also have a welcome table in the back. You can stop by. We've got some gift or a gift for you and information about our ministries. We're just so thankful that you're joining us this morning. Uh, a couple announcements. VBS is next week. Super excited about that. Please continue to be praying. Uh, if you have kids going, regist register online. We will actually have computers set up uh, during the, the family fellowship time carry-in. This morning, stop by. It'll only take a couple minutes, and you'll be all done, ready to go. And that'll make sure that... It's the week after next. No, it's coming next week. It's Sunday. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so register your kids so you won't have to wait in line next Sunday. Uh, for registration, thanks, Bob, though, keeping me in line. <clears throat> uh, now I'm all thrown off. Okay, <laughs> paper towel rolls, there's a soup can in the back, drop them in there. Workers, all workers, this Thursday night at 6.30 in the Cornerstone Room, we're going to have our all-staff meeting. Be there so that you can get information and find out what's going on. Uh, also, today is going to be an exciting day. Uh, I encourage you to stay after Sunday school. We have our carry-in luncheon this morning. We, we're going to provide the meat and drinks, uh, and a lot of people bring lots of desserts, so I'm really excited about that. So even if you didn't bring something, you didn't know about it, it's your first time here, just come and join us. we got plenty of food. It'll just be a sweet time together as a family. We need this. We need to be together. Um, also, I want to mention next Sunday, uh, which is also the start of VBS, uh, next Sunday we have a business meeting right after Sunday school. We've got some uh, business to deal with with the parking lot and the greenhouse. It's not going to take long. Please stay after. If you want to know more, you're just going to have to come to the meeting to find out. But it's good things that we need to do and take care of. So plan to stay after Sunday school for a little bit uh, next Sunday. Also, today is Promotion Sunday. Uh, and that's the day where our, our students move up from one level to the next. So uh, during the Sunday school hour, we'll all meet in here at 11 o'clock sharp. Even if he says 11.05, we're going to start at 11 o'clock. I know he's in charge, but we're going to do 11 o'clock today. Uh, but we'll come. <laughs> Boy, I guess I'm going to be washing wax in his car this week. <laughs> uh, anyhow, 11 o'clock, we're going to be in here, and uh, it'll only take a few minutes, and we'll go into our separate Sunday school classes. Pastor? Thanks, Judas. I mean, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get uh, focused here. 
You know, this is the first Sunday of a month, and therefore this is Missionary of the Month. This month we are featuring, having their pictures in our bulletin, Frank and Tammy Rowe. The Rose are with the mission agency that they're uh, sent out under um, of, called Cross World. Also, Paul and Kim Halsey are with Cross World. The Rose serve in Canada and uh, have been serving for, I think Frank mentions, he has prepared a uh, video. We give him three minutes. He's two minutes and 51 seconds. Yay, Frank. Uh, but anyway, he did a good job, and we're going to hear that right now. Hello. My name is Frank Rowe. My wife Tammy and I have been missionaries for 44 years this August. We will have been married later this month, 45 years. And for the last 11 years, we've lived here in London, Ontario, Canada. Right now, today is election day here in Ontario, and we are voting on new representation here where we live, as well as a new premier, uh, which would be somewhat similar to uh, a governor that you have there in, in Indiana. Our ministry in the summertime changes a little bit since we're no longer able to get into the schools and the colleges, but they're being closed. And so we work primarily at this time meeting with pastors and churches and doing a lot of pulpit supply. The last four weeks, I've been able to speak for uh, at a church on the second missionary journey of Paul. And when we were uh, talking about the Philippian jailer, I gave a salvation invitation. We saw three people who raised their hand for salvation. Also during the summer months, I'm able to get a little bit more into the fire halls, the fire stations, as a chaplain with the City of London Fire Department, and getting the opportunities to talk with the men there, and the men and the women that are there. Last Monday, I was involved in a memorial service for a firefighter who had passed away a few weeks ago. This summer, we will be down in, in Florida in July, uh, be there for a memorial service for my uh, my uncle, he was my last living blood relative. He died a couple of months ago at the age of 92, and my family has asked me to do the memorial service. Right now, this week, I am teaching the book of Judges in, in uh, Uganda, Africa. And so this, was my, this is my sixth year to teach there, and my second year to teach it online. So hopefully, Lord willing, we'll be able to get back there to make an impact in the lives of the students one-on-one. -on -one. We thank you for the ministry and the support that you have in our lives. We pray that God will continue to bless you there. Looking forward to being with you in October for your missions conference and give you a live and complete report at that time. God bless and thank you very much. Yes, Frank and Tammy will be with us in our missions conference this October. Also, from Crossworld, Paul and Kim Halsey will be with us this year as well. So we look forward to our uh, missions conference, and with Frank and Tammy, uh, will be with us at that time. I'd like to ask the ushers if they would come, please, at this time. And here's what we're going to do as they're coming. We're going. I'm going to thank the Lord for the privilege of giving and committing this offering to him. And then uh, the, the Bedford family is going to be spread across up here. And we're going to do the song, not we together, but they are, the uh, theme song for Vacation Bible School that I'm going to follow up with a very brief word about that. You can come up. <laughs> spread across here. Because the minute I'm done uh, thanking the Lord um, and the ushers take the offering, the video is going to start. So uh, this is the theme song that we'll be doing throughout the week beginning next Sunday. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, what a great uh, thing it, it is uh, to be able to record and send things like Frank just did. Thank you for a brief update.
to be able to see his face, to hear about ministry this summer, things that are coming, and I'm sure he just touched the surface. Thank you for the personal interaction he has with people and churches all in different areas of Canada. We're grateful for he and Tammy's ministry, and we look forward to having them come and be with us in October. Now, thank you, our Father, for the privilege of giving. It is important. It is an act of worship, and we, in this aspect of worship, want to worship well. Thanks for the privilege of doing that. Thank you that you gave us the greatest gift. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Western desert hot and dry to do that in practice. <laughs> I kind of knew he would, though. <laughs> All right, and, and listen, we have, a, we have a good supply of these cards. They're nice and colorful, and uh, Zoomerang 2022 uh, Vacation Bible School, and uh, this week would be a great week. You don't want to do it too soon, but we got one more week to kind of walk through your neighborhood or ride your bike through the neighborhood. Nancy and I are going to do that this week throughout the Riverview area. Kind of like early evening, if you see any kids out playing, and it's supposed to be a beautiful week, they'll be out there. We're going to find out who they are and kind of go up to their house and give one of these to family, to parents, and ask if they can come to Vacation Bible School. That would be great if you did that. Our VBS is a church event. It's not just a few people doing it. So if you could participate with us and use these cards to invite, that would be super. All right, let's continue our worship. Let's stand together. A prayer as we honor our graduates this morning should be a prayer for each one of us, that God would supply the vision, the direction, the purpose in our lives.
take a moment to recognize our graduates this year so you know who you are if you can start coming up here uh, we want to just take a moment and we've got a couple questions for you guys because we as a church want to know and want to be praying for you guys so the questions you guys can all line up right here in a row you don't have to be in alphabetical order we're not going to test your abilities you know <laughs> or height or anything but uh good to see josiah uh, we're gonna. What we'd like to know are a couple things. First is where you graduated and what you graduated with, and uh, you know it could just be a high school diploma or your doctor, whatever it is. And then what is next for you? We want to know as a church what's next so we can be praying for you. So Josiah, since you're first in line, you get to start. Uh, my name is Josiah Miller. I graduated from Northridge High School with an honors diploma, and I plan to attend Purdue Fort Wayne in the fall and study computer science. Now I'm going to stand in front of you, Josiah, and walk you. Um, I just graduated from Purdue with my master's in special ed. I'm going to continue teaching while working on my doctorate in special ed curriculum and design through Liberty. Abby? I just graduated from home, and I am planning <laughs> on attending Liberty University in the fall and playing volleyball there. Just make sure you say your name, too in case they don't know you. Hi, I'm Julia. I graduated uh, high school from homeschool, and I plan this fall to do Liberty University online and study uh, business administration. Hello, my name is Court Miller, and I graduated from homeschool, and I plan to do um, welding certification in the fall. We've got a little bit of a, a gift and a card for you. And uh, I put them in alphabetical order, so pastor's got to sift through and find the right ones. <laughs> I'm not the one who graduated here. Come on. <laughs> well, if we could just take a moment and pray for you all this morning. Lord, we thank you and praise you for these young people. Lord, their love for you, their desire to serve you, their involvement here at McCoy. Uh, but Lord, we pray for them as they go out. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the parents and the different leaders and teachers here who have worked and with them and trained them. But Lord, now as they go out, Lord, we pray for your protection over them. 
Uh, Lord, we pray that you would guard their hearts and their minds. Lord, we pray that you would provide, if they are leaving from Elkhart in this area, that you would uh, provide godly, biblically-based churches that they can be connected with and would attend regularly for godly friends and, and older people in their life that would come in and speak into their lives and challenge and encourage them to continue to be in your word and to live in a way that is pleasing to you. Lord, we pray that they would evaluate and seek what you desire for them in their lives. Lord, that they would desire to serve you well. Lord, we pray that you would keep them in your word, that they would be disciplined to study it daily. And Lord, to seek to live it out in their lives. Lord, we pray for your blessing on them and what's next for them. Lord, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's stand again as we read responsively from Philippians. <laughs> Paul writes in Philippians 3, If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want, I want to, know to know Christ, Christ. Yes. yes, to, to know, know the power of his, his resurrection, resurrection and, and participation in his, in his sufferings, sufferings, becoming like him in his death, death. And, and so, so somehow, somehow attaining, attaining to, to the, the resurrection, resurrection from, from the, the dead. dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or having already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus.
This morning, Father, we fully recognize and acknowledge that our strength, our wisdom, our understanding is completely inadequate to accomplish anything worthwhile, anything that is worthwhile for eternity. It's easy for us to do that here together as a body. But as we go our separate ways this afternoon, tomorrow to work, throughout this week and the days and weeks ahead. Remind us of that. Remind us that it's not us. It's Christ in us and Christ through us who accomplishes anything. Help us to keep that in the forefront of our thought, to look to that idea, first of all, whenever making a decision. It's not us. It's you. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I would like you to open your Bibles with me to, fir to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. What a great gospel. The gospel of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. John 1, verses 1 to 3. And I'm just going to read these three verses. 
because we're going to focus on them this morning. We had a busy morning, as you can see, with a lot of things to take care of. We're just going to focus on these three verses, but boy, boy, oh boy, are they powerful. You will know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth will set you free. You know what? Truth is a powerful thing, isn't it? Truth is a stubborn thing. Because when you finally get to the truth, it can change people's lives. Sometimes we do everything but wanting to know the truth. But here it is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The first 18 verses of the Gospel of John constitute, make up a section known as the prologue. The prologue. And there is a special name, a special title that is assigned to Jesus Christ in this prologue, in the first 18 verses, it, that name, that title appears four times in verse 1 that we just read three times and in verse 14, which we didn't read, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Four times this Word appears. He is called the Word, a name, a title assigned to Jesus Christ. He is the Word. It is the Greek word, logos. I'm sure you've heard of it, logos. Logos, the Word. What is a word, folks? A word is a means of communication. In fact, the title, the name of, for Jesus Christ assigned to him, the Word <clears throat> points us to the truth that it is, in the, it is the very nature of God, think of this, to reveal himself. It is the very nature of God, our creator, who created the universe and our earth. It is his nature to speak and reveal himself. Aren't you happy of that? We're not just walking around in the fog. Many are in this world, and it's so sad. This world is enveloped in darkness because the first man who was supposed to rule gave it up and gave control over to Satan. Satan pulled down many angels with him, and he pulled all of the human race down with him too. And the whole world dwells in the lap of the evil one, the scripture says, in spiritual darkness. But I'm so glad that the Lord is referred to as the Word. The Word. It is in the very nature of God to reveal himself. And God has done that in several ways. First of all, the Lord has done that in general revelation, in creation. The Bible says the heavens declare, not whisper, not, not in some secret corner, but the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language anywhere on the earth where their voice is not heard powerful. God has revealed himself in the universe, in creation. His glory, his existence, his orderliness is being declared and displayed all over the earth. So Paul says in Romans 1, men are without excuse. Even on the, that basis of general revelation. But God has also revealed himself in a very special way, special revelation. He has given us his word. 
40 different authors, 1,500 years. But each one of them being protected and guided, God superintended it. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit so that what was written, all scripture, is God-breathed, inspired. That's what that means. God breathed into it. And what is recorded is our creator's very words that he wants us to know. And we are responsible for this. Our eternal salvation, what's going to happen to us, is dependent on what we know and hear from the scriptures. And God has also revealed himself in a special way, not only in the written word, but in the living word. Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 1, look at verse 18, the very last verse of the prologue. Well, verse 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, John says. We have seen it as apostles. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. No one. But God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Has made him known. And I think of the writer to the Hebrews. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. God has spoken to us through his Son. And I just highlight it. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. So Jesus Christ is assigned the title, the name, the word. The word. Now the Apostle John's presentation of Jesus Christ, as I've already hinted at in other messages, his presentation of Jesus Christ is quite different from that of the other Gospels. That doesn't mean they're not good or they're not somehow subordinate in any way, shape, or form, but his presentation is different. John takes a theological view, a theological view, rather than a biographical or historical approach. In the first three verses of John's Gospel that I read, the Apostle John directs our attention to the word before Bethlehem. Where do Matthew, Mark, and Luke start? In Bethlehem. In, the, in his genealogy and the birth narratives that we read at Christmas time in Matthew and Luke, they start there. But John starts before Bethlehem. In fact, he starts before the beginning. Before the beginning. He goes back to his eternal preexistence before creation. The Synoptic Gospels do not do this. As I said, they begin with the genealogy, Matthew and Luke. Begin with genealogy. Their genealogy goes back to Abraham. Luke's goes back to Adam and the birth narratives of Jesus. But in the, and in the case of Mark, Mark starts right out with his baptism by John the Baptist. Doesn't deal with the genealogy, doesn't deal with the birth narrative, just starts there. But John goes further back, much further back. John writes to a timeless, universal audience more than any other of the gospel writers. John stressed the deity of Christ and his unique relationship to God the Father. Over his gospel can be, can be inscribed in gold, behold your God. And by the end, Thomas came to realize that. Though he was skeptical, unless I see, he saw and he said, my Lord and my God. And that is the intent of this gospel and of this apostle is to bring people to an acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is and for them to cry out, my Lord and my God, who finished the work on the cross for my sin and my atonement, that I could be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, his son, the son of God. 
Now, in verses 1 through 3, there are two um, relationships that are featured in these two verses. And I just want to uh, look at those. I just want to just focus on them just for a bit with the, with the church this morning. First of all, there's the word and deity, verses 1 and 2. The word and deity. The word and this one called the word in relationship to God the Father. The word in relation to God the Father. And John makes three statements. Can you believe what he is saying in the first verse? First and second verse here. I mean, there is so much in these two verses. So many dynamic and amazing statements. And he fits it all into three simple statements. But being so simple, don't lose what he's saying. First of all, he says, in the beginning was the word. John focuses on the word's eternal preexistence. He says, in the beginning was the word. Or let me say it this way. In the beginning, the word continually was. What comes to your mind when you read, when you hear the first three words of John's gospel? Genesis. Genesis, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is an intentional reference. John intends you to remember this, to think of it. In the beginning takes us all the way back to Genesis 1.1. In fact, it's more than that. Do you know what the Hebrew... The Hebrew title or name for the first book of the Old Testament is, I know what you're going to say, Genesis. It is. However, the Hebrew Bible is much different. We get that name, Genesis, which is appropriate, from the Greek translation from the Septuagint. But the name for the Hebrew in the Hebrew Bible for the book of Genesis is its very first word, Bereshit, which means, guess what? In the beginning. So when John says in the beginning, he's going back to the first book of the Old Testament and the first verse of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The opening words of John's gospel bear a stirring, startling resemblance to the opening words of Genesis, and that's intentional. But John's own particular contribution is to show that the word existed before creation. That's the point. The imperfect tense of the verb to be in the beginning was. That's an imperfect tense. And it has a sense of timelessness. That's why some translate it in the beginning. The word continually was. Already. John's message is that the word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us predates the universe and goes back into eternity with God. He didn't have a beginning himself, but he existed from all eternity. And you know, that's why John's gospel is without a genealogy. Because Jesus, the word, goes back beyond before the creation back into eternity past. There never was a time when the word was not. There never was a time when the word was not. The second statement John makes, building upon the first one, he says, and the word was with God. And the word was with God. There's a lot in that phrase. This assertion identifies the word as a separate entity from God. A separate entity. Two persons are in the Godhead. Now, we know from other scriptures that three are, right? The triunity of God. But here, the assertion is that the word is a separate personality, a separate entity from God. The Bible teaches there is but one God but three persons, there are three distinct persons or personalities in the Godhead. The Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. That is biblical teaching. That is sound teaching. That is what God's word reveals, no matter what men say about God. This is what he has revealed to us. They are distinct persons, but they are co-equal and co-eternal. And there are two errors that we must avoid when it comes to this matter. It is a slippery slope, the triunity of God, and understanding this, we really can't completely. One God, three personalities, and that's what John is saying. He's saying, and the word was with, with God. There was fellowship, companionship. Wasn't God lonely all those eternal ages before he created the universe and the earth? And what's the answer? No. The word was with God. And it's a very slippery slope. Sometimes when we, people hear this, they can slip off into polytheism. There more than one God. Or sometimes they can go the other extreme and slip into Unitarianism, which is the Unitarians deny the Trinity and emphasize the unity of God. They would say that God's, that God's different names, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, describe different roles he played at different times. For example, they're called modalists in the early church. They were called modalists. Because they claim that God appeared in different modes. Sometimes he appeared as the Father. Sometimes he appeared as the Son. Sometimes he appeared as the Spirit. But only in one mode at any time. They deny the triunity of God. The Bible does not teach Unitarianism. The Bible does not teach modalism. So that's the second statement. The third statement, we have in the first statement the eternal preexistence of the word, the distinct personality of the word, and his absolute deity of the word. Notice that last statement. It's on the screen. Look at your Bibles. And the word was God. The word was God. John is not saying the word was divine. No, he says the word was God. This statement answers the question, does the distinction drawn between the word and God make the word somewhat less than God? Even though, even a little bit. The answer is no. Though the word is not the same as God the Father personally, they are the same in quality or essence, co-equal, co-eternal, both our deity along with the Holy Spirit. There is one God, three persons in the Godhead. And you can use any illustration you want, the, the yolk and the egg, you know, uh, all these illustrations people come up with, but we will never fully, fully comprehend that concept except the Bible teaches it. And because the Bible teaches it, we believe it. And we'll never be able to completely understand it. But that's what the scripture says. And we bow in submission and in acceptance of this is what God the creator has revealed to us. And it's important that we acknowledge that. But just look at this. Nothing could be, nothing could be more powerful than this. The word in his relationship to God. His eternal preexistence. In the beginning was the word. The word continually was. His distinct personality and the word was with God and his absolute deity. And the word was God. Period. The word was God. Now there's another relationship that is emphasized and this is in, in particularly in verse 3. And that is the word and, and creation. The word and creation. The word in relationship to the universe. The heavens and the earth. All of it. And this earth, this globe, the realm that God created. 
to have a kingdom on. The universe and this globe. The word in relationship uh, to the universe. The word in creation. The first thing I want to say here that we've already touched on is this. He predates the universe. We've already made that point, but I just, in relationship, he predates it. Look what verse 3 says. Through him, that is through the word, the special name for Jesus Christ, through him all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. States it twice. Two different directions as he comes at that. But he predates the universe. The, uni the word continually was, eternally existed at the Father's side. He is not part of the creation. He is the creator. And that's the second thing that John says here well, That in verse 3. He says, as I pointed out, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The first part of verse 3 states the fact positively. The last part restates the truth in a way that emphasizes there are no exceptions. Every created thing came into being through the creative activity of the Word. All three persons of the Trinity were involved in the work of creation, but John emphasizes the work of the Word as do other New Testament writers. Notice these verses. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, but there, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. All things from God the Father, all things through the agency of his son. What about Colossians chapter 1, uh, 15 through 17? He is the image, speaking of Jesus Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. He takes preeminence over it all because all was created through him. He predates it, but he is preeminent because he is the Creative agency. He created all things. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority. In other words, not only the physical universe, but the angelic creation, powers, authorities, and as well as the first man and the first woman from that man's side. He is before all things. He's not part of the creation. He is before all things, and in him, notice this phrase, and in him, everything holds together. What's holding the universe together? Jesus Christ. He created it. He manages it. He oversees it. And in him, everything holds together. What about this one? Oh, yeah, and then, yeah, emphasizing that all things were created, notice this, all things were created by him, the word, Jesus Christ, and for him, he is before all things, he is not part of creation at all, and in him, all things hold together. Powerful stuff. One more. Hebrews 1 says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Through whom he made the universe. Powerful, powerful truths. And one last thing I want to say about the fact he predates the universe, he created the universe, and this is not necessarily directly in John, 
but it is certainly there in the Bible, in the New Testament. He controls it all. In him, all things hold together. And there are some implications of this for our own lives, and that is this. It's vital to remember these truths that I'm, that I'm going to share with you. He controls the universe. He predates it. He created it. He controls it. And the first is this. There is no situation, dear people. There is no situation that, that is not under control. At least one amen would have been helpful. Amen. Thank you, Bob. There is no situation that is not under control. We live in a time right now in our country and around the world that it seems like things are falling to apart. The, the things that we planned on, the things that we thought were stable and foundational and that have guided our country for a couple of centuries seem to be flaunted and it seems to be at least beginning to break apart. May God help us and may that not happen. But I want you to know, and you may need this truth someday. I may need this truth someday. There is no situation that is not under control. And if you are the, a child of God, if you are one of God's sheep, my sheep, hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give to them eternal life and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Don't be afraid, Jesus said, of those who can kill the body but have, cannot touch the soul. So there is no situation that is not under control. Love Paul's statement to the Ephesians. In chapter 1, he says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the mighty, this is the same mighty power. So Paul is praying for the church and he's saying, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those who believe. Do we understand it? I'd like to say we do. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. What a statement. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Does Jesus love his church? Amen. And what is that? What is the church? Is it a building on some corner somewhere? No. It is those sheep, those that have believed by grace, only by grace, on the Lord Jesus Christ, their sins have been forgiven. They've been born again. That is the church. That is the church. And always remember this important truth. There is no situation that is not under the control, is under his control. And then secondly, God's at work in it, that is, in any situation, Good or bad, God is at work in it doing the good that he promised to do. Did God promise to do good? Yeah. What about Romans 8? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And who are they? Those who have been called according to his purpose. And then his purpose is spelled out in five statements. For new, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. The whole thing is a done deal for those who are the called in accordance with his purpose. And by the way, that's God's business. 
not ours, right? It's our responsibility to give the gospel and invite people to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Powerful. So those two statements. Now I just want to end by making this very personal, and I trust this will be a blessing to you when you think of the fact that the name assigned to Jesus Christ, and only here, four times, in the prologue to the Gospel of John, the Word is very powerful. And in his relationship, first of all, to God, the Word's relationship to God, and the Word's relationship to all of creation. The first is this. I was just thinking about these things. Every day is a new beginning. Do you love that? I do. Every day. I'm so thankful that when the Lord established creation, he put the earth in space, the universe he created, and the earth spins around one time, whoops, the earth spins around one time in 24 hours, right? And every morning, I love to get up early in the morning. I'm an early morning person. It's dark out when I get up and when I get over to the office and when I walk outside, I just love the quietness of the morning. And it's a time to be able to reflect on the day ahead. It's a time to say, oh Lord, thank you for a brand new day. And if there were failures from the day before, failures that I haven't taken care of that have brought to my mind, I need to take care of them. Not just let it go and ignore it. I need to go to the Lord and I need, I need to confess what I need to confess. And if other people are involved, I need to go to them too. But every new day is a new beginning. And God's in charge and God's in control. And because I'm his child and because I'm still in this world, there's something for me to do today for Jesus. Something to do. Every day's a new beginning. So I'm so thankful for these cycles, 24 cycles, 24-hour cycles. So there's a new beginning. And 365 and a quarter a year. And we have to make up with it. Make it up every four years, right? Add February 29th on there. Anyone born on February 29th? Raise your hand. You poor, sad person. <laughs> you miss your birthday presents and all of it. Okay. Every day there's a new beginning. Every day there is hope, folks. Amen? I'm not trying to just whip, whip everyone's emotions up, but every day there's, a new, there's, a, there's hope. What is prepared for us is so much greater than we can ever think or imagine. Every day there's hope because the Word is in charge. He's holding everything together. He's calling people out. He's building His church. And if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and understood that Jesus died for your sin, and you've come to him, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And you've trusted him to save you. He will. And every day there's hope. There is no hope apart from Christ. There is no hope. Every day there should be, there must be surrender. Every day we have a chance to this person called the Word to surrender our lives, to make a new beginning, to repair what has been done the day before, even if it's by way of confession, going to people, asking for... But whatever it is, every day is a day of surrender. Jesus said, whoever would be my disciple, whoever wants to follow me, must deny himself daily, take up his cross, and follow me daily every day must be a day of surrender where we we recognize his authority and who he is and what he did and surrender our bodies as a living sacrifice holy pleasing to god it's your reasonable act of worship and then finally every day 
I believe there must be commitment. Commitment, consecration of ourselves to do the Lord's work. For God to use us. And you know what? At the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, um, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Yes, Lord. Then feed my sheep. And then he said, follow me. You follow me. Don't worry about with the, this other one. You follow me. Every day there must be a commitment, a surrender and a commitment, a consecration to do the Lord's work, whatever that may, may be that day. Lord, use me today. Help me to be aware of what's going on around me. May I be a means of feeding your sheep and to follow you no matter what that path may be because you're with me at all times. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. The word, always remember the word, God reveals himself to us. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, I want to thank you for our time together as we've been able to look at these first couple of verses. They are so big, so amazing. They, they, they expand our mind as to who, when we talk about Jesus Christ, who we're talking about and the impact and the implications over our lives each day. May we have great joy because of this today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand again as we close out our service. I had a friend years ago who used to love to look at us when we start talking about some of these things, God, and trying to understand, wrap our brain around some of the concepts. And he would say, sometimes we just have to let God yeah, be God. Right. We will never completely understand but we can still trust, we can still hope, we can still serve him.
Amen. Well, I was going to say 11.05, but Christopher squashed that. So therefore, if your t fellowship time is shortened, you know who to go to. <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Thank you, our Father, for a wonderful morning, and we're looking forward to our classes to follow. Thank you for those that are going to be moved up in Sunday school, and we just want to honor them and recognize them. Thank you for... Uh, the fellowship time after our, our, um, our dinner together, supper, cookout, whatever you want to call it, we're grateful that we can enjoy that together. We pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. We're going to start at 11 in here. 11.